and then starts this what has been termed the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. I suppose it would be right to say, and I think you would agree with me, that this is one of the most difficult and one of the most controversial passages in the whole of the Bible. There has been endless literature written on it. Sometimes, you know, you can, uh, you know what's coming if you watch and read the subtitle. You might see a booklet written, The Parable of the Rich Man and Lazarus, subtitle, What Jesus Taught Concerning Hell. Well, you know what's coming, don't you? Or, The Parable of the Rich Man and Lazarus, What Christ Taught Concerning the Faith of the Wicked. You know more or less what's coming, don't you? Well now, how are we going to understand? Well, friends, we can only understand by comparing Scripture with Scripture. And I'm afraid that's what so many of God's children don't do. They approach this with their minds already made up. And they, they hold tenaciously certain ideas and they want to find a backing for it in the Bible. And they find it in this parable, just what they've been looking for. And so they cling on to it with all their might. Now, of course, that's wrong. You and I must come to the Word of God with open minds, not with minds made up. We'll never get light like that. And we've got to compare Scripture with Scripture. Some, of course, will say, oh, but this is a literal story. This is not a parable, because it starts off, there was a certain rich man. And the word parable isn't used. Perfectly true. But then, so does the previous one. First verse. And he said to his disciples, there was a certain rich man. So what? Are we going to teach that that's not a parable? And if you read the parable of the prodigal son, the word parable is not used at all. But it is a parable nevertheless. Now I'm not saying, I'm not arguing for one moment as to whether this is a parable or not. That's beside the point. It won't affect the interpretation. But if you hear that argument that it cannot be a parable, and it must be literal because it starts off by saying there was a certain rich man, the Greek says a certain man was rich. Well, that's no argument at all as you compare it with the opening verses and other parts of Scripture. No, we've got to look at this parable and uh, read exactly what is said and then remind ourselves as to what the scriptures have already taught concerning death and what follows. Now, what scriptures were available at this time? Get this clear in your minds. Well, it wasn't the New Testament, was it? Hadn't been written. There had been nothing written at this point. Not one of the Gospels. So, it could only be the Old Testament scriptures. All right. Now, when we search the Old Testament scriptures from Genesis to Malachi, can we find anything approaching this parable? Well, let's be honest, we can't. There's nothing there at all. So, that should make us begin to think there's something wrong in taking this literally, as though the Lord is giving a revelation of what happens after death. Moreover, if you start taking it literally, all the difficulties you'll land yourself in. You see, many Christians say, ah, but you see, this is a, the Lord is drawing aside away the veil, uh, drawing aside the veil from death, and we're seeing what happens to the saved and to the unsaved. Well, who said they were saved and unsaved? You have in this parable two men, a certain rich man and a certain poor man. You're not told anything about their moral qualities, whether one was good or one was bad, whether one was a believer or not a believer. Now, to read those things in is simply a biased mind that's doing that. It's a made-up mind, you see. We mustn't do that. And uh, what happened? Well, one died, and you've got the whole positions reversed. The rich man has a bad time, wakes up, and finds himself in torment. And the poor man finds himself in what I suppose people would term to be heaven. It's called in this part of scripture, Abraham's bosom. 
So let's be honest. If we want to teach truth, if this is literal truth, this is what we teach then. This is how we preach the gospel. If you want to be saved, be as poor, give away all your money, lay at somebody's gate and have plenty of sores and be miserable, that will put you right. Because the next thing that happens after death, you'll be taken to heaven. And if you want to be lost, well, be rich. Because surely, as sure as you're rich, on the other side, you'll wake up and find yourself in hell. Now, is that scriptural truth? There's no gospel truth in it, friends. It just is not true. Scripture does not teach that the positions are automatically reversed after death like that. While we know only too well, it depends entirely upon the attitude of men and women to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what's going to happen to them after death. Well, we must look a little close, more closely at this parable. I think we ought to read it. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. Apparently that's what you've got to do to be lost. You see, have plenty of money and have a good time, fare sumptuously, you'll be lost all right. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. Now we are we are thrown back on the Old Testament scriptures. The only part of God's word was then written in the Old Testament. <clears throat> Is there one scripture that uses that phrase of life after death? Not a single one. Abraham's bosom. Well, you may ask me then, where did it come from? I shall be uh, trying to show you in just a moment. He was found then in Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died, verse 22, and was buried. And in hell, he lifted up his eyes, being in torments. Now, when you look at this word, it's not the usual word for hell at all. There are two words in the original translated in our English Bible, hell. One is Hades. And it's the grave, or the state of the grave. It's where the Lord Jesus Christ went himself. Because that psalm, Psalm 16, was fulfilled of him. Thou wilt not leave his soul in Hades. That's the grave. Nor was it left in Hades because he was gloriously resurrected on the third day. He took up his life afresh, like he claimed he could do. The other word is the word Gehenna. And it does mean hellfire. And it occurs in that solemn passage, which we have already considered, in Mark's Gospel where the Lord warns about the offending members that must be cut off, lest they're cast into hell fire. But that's not the word used here. The Bible knows nothing of Hades as a place of torment. In Hades, in the grave, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and sees Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, but well, why did he cry to Abraham? Why not cry to God? Why cry to Abraham? What could Abraham do anyway? This is almost getting like uh, the Roman conception of praying to the saints, isn't it? Oh, dear, dear, dear. So here's something that obviously doesn't ring true. Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I'm tormented in this flame. And Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime received thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. That's what Abraham said. I think if that was true, friends, he must have said that with, with his tongue in his cheek. Why? Because Abraham himself was a rich man. Do you remember that? Well, let's look back and see. Genesis chapter 13. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 13. Verse 1. And Abram went up out of Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and lot with him into the south. And Abraham was very rich in cattle, in silver, and in gold. So what right did he to chide the rich man when he had been rich himself? That also doesn't ring true, does it? 
little bit hypocritical. Oh, you know, you had a you had a good time. You were rich when you were on up, or so was he. But he wasn't in in hellfire afterwards, as far as we understand. No, there's something that's radically wrong about this. And then he said, but above all, he said, there's this great gulf fixed. But in spite of the great gulf fixed, they can still talk to one another. Those in Abraham's bosom, so-called, supposedly heaven, leaning over and talking to somebody in hell, do you believe that's possible? Is this really, is the Lord drawing aside the curtain and showing us what's going to happen? Well, friends, if that's so, honestly, I'll be quite frank. And I'll say, I don't want to be there. Could you, now just think, be honest, could you go through eternity in sheer enjoyment and yet see someone that's near and dear to you now in hell and see them there writhing in the most fearful torment forevermore and be able to talk with them? Wouldn't that spoil heaven for you? Oh dear, it would for me. Why, even... In our present state, frail and sinful, though we are, I don't think I, and I don't think you, could look with equanimity on someone being tormented in fire forevermore. It would be too fearful. And if I can't stand it now, well, I'm sure when I'm holy and righteous as Christ is, I'm not going to be uh, able to so to do. If it's going to affect me now as a frail, sinful being, what about then? Oh, no, no, no. There's something absolutely wrong about this. And then note at the end, Abraham said to him, they have Moses and the prophets. No, this is right. We are thrown back to the Old Testament scriptures, but as we've seen, the Old Testament knows nothing of torment whatsoever. I challenge anybody who adopts the orthodox interpretation of this part of the word of God to find me one statement in the Old Testament that teaches what they call eternal torment because there isn't one. They've got the Old Testament, the prophets. But no, you won't find it there. Well, where will you find it then? Well, I'll tell you where you'll find it. You'll find it in their traditions, friends. And we're very thankful to think we have the writings of reliable historians such as Josephus, who has told us in writing exactly what the Pharisees believed. Now, remember, they're still there. The Lord is still talking to them. And he's really showing up their traditional beliefs. He's not giving truth at all. I'm going to just quote one or two verses from Josephus. He says, There is one descent into this region at whose gate we believe there stands an archangel with an host. Which gate? When those that pass through are conducted down by the angels, and where does the Bible talk about angels conducting anybody down to a place called hell or to heaven? They wait for that rest and eternal new life in heaven, which is to succeed this region, this place we call the bosom of Abraham. So now you know where the title comes from, not from the word of God, but from the Pharisee tradition. This region is allowed for, now he's talking about Hades, as a place of custody for souls in which angels are appointed as guardians to them to distribute to them temporary punishments agreeable to everyone's behaviour and manners. Where does God's word teach that angels have got the power to hand out punishments to people before the day of judgment? The Bible knows nothing of individual judgment upon death as though God is sitting on a throne every day judging as people die or giving it to angels to die. But the Pharisees believed it. This is part of their tradition, which they added to the word of God. And then, now those angels that are set over those souls drag them into the neighborhood of hell itself, who, when they are hard by it, continually hear the noise of it and do not stand clear of the hot vapor itself. A chaos, deep and large, is fixed between them. Here's your great gulf fix. All friends, there it is. This is the Pharisees' tradition. At this time, Judaism had got leavened with Platonism, with all the teaching from pagans. The immortality of the soul and all their conception of life after death. This is what the Pharisees were believing and teaching. And the Lord is showing it up. Oh, don't let's think this is, this is God's truth. Because it just doesn't fit with any other part of Scripture. 
Note the conclusion of it, and then we must close. Verse 30 and 31, he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went to them from the dead, they will repent. And he said to them, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, oh yes, you've got to go back to the Old Testament. This is the thing that will teach you correctly. If they won't hear that, neither will they persuade it, though one rose from the dead. And the fact is, friends, that somebody did rise from the dead, and his name was Lazarus. The very thing that God did it. Christ did it. He took somebody out of the grave for the name of Lazarus, who'd been there for four days. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. He gave a demonstration. And did that affect the Pharisees? Did that convince them? No, it did not. How true. They won't repent, although one rises from the dead. So here's a Lazarus doing it. No, this is the Lord turning their own teaching, their own traditions, against themselves. Oh, let's be honest about this. Whether we call it a parable or not doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. But you've got the two, you've got these two classes brought forward. The rich man, the Pharisees, and you've got the poor Lazarus, the poor, the publicans, and sinners. And if you want to uh, understand what the attitude of the Pharisees should have been, Mark you, uh which were written in the law, and remember, they were supposed to be the faithful custodians of the law. I haven't got time now to quote it, but I want you to read Deuteronomy chapter 15, verses 7 to 11. And that will tell you quite clearly what their attitude should have been to the poor. The one symbolized by Lazarus. God's word was very specific about that. Well now, there's the point where we must close because the length of the tape and I hope that we haven't wasted our time in looking at this chapter, a very difficult chapter, and I do hope that it's been a help to us. God willing, we will continue this in our next study. For Christ's sake, Amen.